I hear my disclosures, uh, most of which involve uh, uh, academic commitments and grants. Um, here's the issue. We uh, have talked a lot about this great technology today, and we've talked a lot about why it's important for us to standardize what we're doing and, pr and provide more predictable outcomes. And since you're in Seattle, I thought I'd introduce you to uh, uh, Bob Mecklenburg, who's done a lot of work, in, and you can just uh, Google his work in the Harvard Business Review. I've worked with him now for uh, over a decade, and I've learned a lot from him. And, and, and really, the problem for purchasing healthcare is a lack of transparency. So if you go uh, a couple miles away to Pike Place Market, you know what you're buying, and you know the quality. However, when people are purchasing healthcare, quality and value seem to be under the table. That is a whole idea of predictability. Are we offering a product that has any predictable nature? Or are we just providing an avalanche of unnecessary care to these patients? Um, and, and, and this is what we're being judged on in, uh, in, in some of the press. Um, so we, we gotta look at ourselves a little bit more critically. And then there's the idea of who's accountable for complications and bad outcomes and malplaced screws and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, we are gonna be inundated with this work because people are getting older and degenerative spinal deformities are increasing. Degenerative spinal conditions are increasing. Uh, however, we have unsustainable healthcare costs and not a real good algorithm to take care of these patients. Uh, we've written a fair amount about how we use lean methodology, which is the, 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 the uh, a title of this talk, to eliminate variability, standardize appropriateness criteria, um, and use a car manufacturing method to help you figure out how to do this. And the idea here is to adopt standard work, which is to root out variation. Um, and once you do that, you can actually improve a process. So without standard work, uh, there can be no improvement. And this involves looking at the seven wastes uh, of the Toyota production system, much of which is involved in American spine surgery today, which you can see some of the ideas of over-processing, inventory, uh, motion defects, et cetera. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit specifics about this. So the question is, is at your center, are there five different standards for choosing an operative patient, particularly in spine, where the operative indications have been, have been questioned by many uh, outside of our uh, neurosurgical and orthopedic fields? So we, we should think about that uh, very carefully. And you might say, I'm not building a car. I'm taking care of an individual. This is a mom or a grandmother or a sister. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not taking care of a car. This is what I used to say when I was first introduced to this methodology. The reality of it is, is when you fly an airplane or you buy a car, you expect a standard product. You expect safety. And uh, some of this was talked about by the earlier speaker about developing these things in a standard way about how we communicate, how we build our rooms, how we do work sustainably. And then there's this whole idea of how we standardize processes to reduce all these horrible complications that we see, particularly in complex spine surgery, which is a big uh, uh, topic of focus today um, uh, in terms of getting uh, our instrumentation in safely. But the real issue is, is these complications are, are rampant in adult deformity surgery. So we first published this a couple of years ago when we studied uh, 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 our work uh, pre and post standardization. Um, and the standardization was all rooted at this because this is, the, this is the Dartmouth Atlas and this is what you're seeing for the utilization of American spine surgery and it hasn't changed that much, which is that if you live in Massachusetts, your, your conversion to spine surgery is very different than your conversion in Washington State. So we gotta think about why that is and, and, and figure out how we fix it. And we think that a systemic multidisciplinary initiative is the way to go where you're thinking about population health you're thinking about cost and value, and you're doing this in a way that you're thinking about an entire population of patients and stratifying them uh, in a very selective way and a very standardized way to deliver the same output variables. And again, you saw this earlier, this is all around controlling your risks with standard pathways and putting these pathways in place to help surgeons and patients get to a better outcome. We published a, a series showing that a lot of our work is coming uh, uh, and giving its big fruit in the first 30 days. And that's where some of the biggest spend is. These are also CMS never events that are all happening in the first 30 days. So if you can get these complications down early, uh, you can pot potentially start to increase the cost effectiveness of these operations uh, and get them in a better place. Now you might say this is a uniquely American problem. I had the pleasure this year of being the keynote speaker at the British Association of Spine Surgeons and actually they uh, had a whole working group session because the NHS has reduced the, uh, the budget for spinal surgery uh, approximately uh, a fair percent 
uh, rate per year for the last several years because they don't think it's providing value. So it's not just, it's not just us, it's everywhere. Now, why is this? If you look at the utilization of spinal surgery in the United States, and you look at rel relative utilization, if you look at a, a, a time-tested diagnosis that we all operate on, spondylolisthesis, look at the population-adjusted relative utilization over the last uh, uh, many years. I'm not going to comment on why this is. This is just data for you to chew on. If you look at the utilization of lumbar fusion for degenerative disc disease, and then you look at the costs of spine surgery compared to other really good uh, therapies in American medicine like knee replacement and dialysis, look at how much we cost compared to everybody else. That's why this is essentially unsustainable unless we start to think about standard work. And why is it not cost effective? In my opinion, the data would show that uh, we have little standard work. We have a lot of perverse uh, economic incentives. Uh, we have fee-for-service, which in America hasn't changed much. Uh, private payers and governments are fed up. A lot of our fellow docs, we don't really understand the economics of healthcare delivery. I, I think we need to do that so we can help to control this. We have an explosion of administrators uh, in, in American hospitals, uh, and somebody's got to pay for all those administrators. Um, and ob obviously, we got to build a better system so these better algorithms can win. Now, a lot of our colleagues have done this work um, in complex spine, in scoliosis, uh, and some of this was started at Northwestern by showing that working in teams and standardizing these pre, during, and post phases is the way to go. This is from our colleagues just north of the border, showing us that the complication rates are actually much higher than, they, than you actually think they are. So the question is, is, is spinal deformity surgery sustainable for, with all of these issues that we know? The answer is no. Um, at the same time, these patients are stuck because non-operative management doesn't really help a lot of these patients. Surgery may be the only option for a lot of them. However, we don't have a sustainable algorithm to do this. Um, some of the work in the ISSG has showed that you, got, you can't revise this case for 10 years in order for it to be quote unquote cost effective. So you gotta really, you got one shot to get it right. And if you don't get it right on the first shot, it's not cost effective. Now, we should be driving this reform, um, um, as uh, many of the audience are surgeons here, uh, uh, and, and not necessarily uh, being written about in, uh, in, a, in a press as it currently is. This is currently a big problem for us because the, the, the lay press has, uh, has uh, beguiled spinal surgery, and it's only going to get worse unless we figure out better algorithms. Um, and why are we facing this conundrum? We're facing the conundrum because we don't have algorithms. And I think that's going to help us. There's variability in the use of healthcare resources. There's variability in outcomes. And we're stuck in this system of perverse healthcare economics uh, that pits us uh, against one another. So Ted was here earlier, and he's always talked about the fact that we have not spent enough cerebral time uh, before these operations, these bigger operations, particularly figuring all this stuff out before these patients get to surgery. So we've looked at this in a multidisciplinary format of presenting these patients and requiring a multidisciplinary opinion prior to proceeding to surgery. We've published a lot of work on this uh, as to who's involved. All of the service lines involved in this are given an equal vote uh, as to surgery. So it's not just the surgeon. Uh, neurosurgeon, orthopedic spine surgeon, it's actually the physiatrist, it's actually uh, the, the, the uh, uh, nurses, the PAs, the, the spine uh, anesthesiologist, pain docs, they're given all an equal vote as to the suitability of surgery. Um, and we uh, require this type of a note to go into the uh, electronic medical record before these patients can go to surgery, before they can get anesthesia booking. Now, we first presented this at IMAST in 2011. It was not very popular. It was uh, kind of seen as a death panel or uh, something that was restricting care for these patients. But it actually um, uh, has gone a long way since then, and, you, and, and we've been looking more at how we can uh, take these protocols into other areas of surgery uh, uh, outside of spine, and this has become standard work. All of these patients get a standard workup, which includes bone density scanning, neuropsychological testing, formal class, uh, and we're trying to remove perverse economic incentives to get them to surgery with a multidisciplinary opinion. It's not a surgeon-only opinion, it's, it's everybody's opinion. And we try to address all of the problems that we know plague spine patients, neuropsychological conditions, opiate abuse, 
people that don't have adequate home support to deal with these operations. Try to do all this well before. So ultimately, what we're looking at now is, is how are we going to provide a more sustainable result and how are we going to provide warranties? So as you know, we've provided bundles now uh, for spinal conditions. We've provided uh, uh, bundles even for complex spine and adult deformity uh, uh, starting in the beginning of 2017. And that involves using this multidisciplinary format to empower everybody to make a decision. And what we found, um, as was uh, published in Spine by my last fellow, that this, this actually provides something different when it's just a solitary person making a decision. And what we're looking at is we're looking for alternate reasons to, to essentially not do surgery on a lot of these patients until they're optimized. So we're not operating on smokers. We're not operating on morbidly obese patients. We're trying to maximize conservative management, particularly for these degenerative indications. Um, and we're also showing that we're changing surgical plans as a result of uh, wisdom of crowds, maybe choosing some uh, uh, more uh, uh, simple approaches rather than these big, massive deformity corrections for those that can tolerate it. Now, this has been shown in other fields. This is not something unique to, to, to our approach or to uh, the approaches in spine surgery. This is really uh, in, in, other, in other fields where... Uh, uh, aggregating the independent judgments of doctors often outperforms uh, the best doctor in a group. Now, the other idea in using the Toyota production system is when we know something mitigates risk, we need to make it standard work. So we decided that two attending surgeons was, was something that, that really helped with these complex, larger operations. And we made that standard work uh, and made criteria for how we did that. Right, this was uh, first published on by our colleagues just south of us in San Francisco, and you can see in the left-hand column that they showed significant improvement in all of their outcome variables uh, uh, for using two attending surgeons. Um, there was no brainer for us to do that. So, so now if you book a, a, a large uh, uh, operation greater than six levels, any three column osteotomy, you have to have two attending surgeons on the operative record in order to book it. So these are really some of the tenants, really from a car manufacturing company, of standard work. Standard work rules the roost. So what's the high value care of the future look like? We've done a lot of work on warranties and bundles, and we're continuing our work in guaranteeing our products, which is what Toyota does. Uh, so here you go. Here's our, our newest scoring algorithm for predicting 30-day uh, uh, risk in spinal deformity, in, in spinal deformity surgery. Uh, it's got a good multivariate model with a good ROC curve. And here's the idea. This is really basic. Uh, we could put these outcome variables into uh, input variables into this system, and we can spit out a complication rate. So this patient, who's 60 years old, uh, female, uh, high BMI, who's anemic, who's not hypertensive, not smoking, and is diabetic, has a very high complication rate. So if we elect to do this surgery, this surgery we're not going to do under a warranty. However, you take the opposite patient. I'm giving you both ends of the spectrum. This is a 60-year-old uh, uh, lady who's got a low BMI, who's not anemic, doesn't smoke, not hypertensive, not diabetic. This is one where we can guarantee our product. So we're just thinking about this in terms of predictive analytics and how can we predict and provide a much, much more uh, uh, kind of verified product. Now, I've been able to convince my colleagues at the ISSG to do some work in, in, in standard work, and we just uh, uh, presented this at NAS. And this is a pretty loud analysis of why we don't have standard work, okay, or, or the fact that we don't have standard work. Um, the decision making for these really complex operations is difficult. We know that. These patients are really debilitated. They really need help. Um, and we don't necessarily have standard work that's been identified, let's say through the Scoliosis Research Society or other academic societies. So we looked at 650 um, adult spinal deformity patients who enrolled in a multi center database. And we used uh, uh, something called recursive partitioning in order to look at a standard work score that we developed using what we know are the bad indicators, things like mental health, body mass index, smoking history, antifibrillinic use, and, uh, antifibrillinic use, and a frailty score. And then we assessed the variability of these factors um, in this group. Um, we, again, came up with these numbers based on the best data that we had uh, and, and looked at BMI um, and frailty score as being major predictors of complications, readmissions, and reoperations. I apologize if this came out uh, uh, short, but the idea here is, is that one out of 650 
uh, uh, 650 patients had no negative variables at the time of surgery. One out of 650 patients. And this is a very high performing group of, of, uh, of patients. So if you could see what happens there is we end up having a major problem with the lack of standard work. So my slides disappeared, but in conclusion, not sure what happened. I still have four minutes and 46 seconds. <laughs> uh, We've, uh, I think, shown through a lot of our work uh, um, in, in uh, our academic societies and uh, much of the work we've published here that standardization enhances patient safety. Pathways, protocols, and dashboards help us enhance the durability of what we can do. Um, High-level medical center administrative support is absolutely necessary. I do believe that, you know, I was a big naysayer about using a car uh, manufacturing method to think about something as complicated as spinal surgery, but it actually works because it's all about standard work. Um, I do believe we have to say no much more than we currently do um, until we can optimize these patients. Uh, we are stuck in a system of fee-for-service where there are so many perverse incentives that, 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 that don't empower us to do the right things for our patients. So that's a larger initiative uh, that, that we have to think about. And we have to be well-versed in the economics of healthcare delivery as surgeons going forward. Um, um, I really think that surgeons can lead the efforts because we ultimately have to sit in front of these patients and we ultimately have their best interests at heart. Thank you.